And I want you to think about that. <laughs> we want the little boy to win, don't we? But life isn't like that, is it? Sometimes life is just a nice. Why is it that some, you know, real pricks just seem to sail through life without a care of the world and really good, kind people seem to suffer so much? Why is it that people's legs seem to stop walking the moment they step on an escalator? And why is it that drivers <laughs> wearing hats cause so many accidents? <laughs> we don't know why, do we? we? We just know that we do. It's a mystery. But I know some of you will use them. <laughs> because he's counting on me. Oh, that is so weak, I'm going to use that. <laughs> I was 18 when I told my parents that I was going to go out to Australia. I said, I'm going to emigrate to Australia. And my mum said, you're going to migrate to Australia. I said, no, birds do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I actually left on a ship. I actually left on the ship. I didn't really have much of an idea about what Australia was going to be like, to be honest. I lived in Wales then. And like many British immigrants, we didn't really have a great understanding of what it was like here. And I also had a bit of a superiority complex, like many British immigrants. You know, it was a bit like, Mummy, Daddy, I'm going to Australia for adventure. <laughs> yes, I'll show those colonials a thing or two. <laughs> and when I got here, very quickly got my head punched in. <laughs> I can remember when the ship left the dock. I can remember like it was yesterday. I was standing on the, on the side of the ship as it pulled away from Southampton Dock. My heart was in my head. You know, it was like this terrible feeling. Maybe it was the an anticipation of what was to come. You can't hear me now, can you? <laughs> or maybe it's because I've left my luggage in the boot of my dad's car. <laughs> but it was a, a feeling of woe. And I don't really remember much about the trip, to be honest, you know, but young guy going to this place, didn't know anybody, you know, I had 50 pounds in my pocket and that was it. And uh, the ship was the Australis, yeah, beautiful Greek liner, state of the arse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> used, used to blow out this black smoke that would gently descend from all the passengers as they lined the decks. <laughs> We never got suntan because of the protective lights. <laughs> and I was the youngest one in the cabin. There were six guys, all of us single guys going out there. I was the youngest. They were in their mid to late twenties, some of them even in their thirties. Here's an interesting thing though. I told you I was one of six in that cabin. I was the only one who stayed. Four of those guys within three weeks had gone back to the UK. And the other guy had gone back within about three months. Isn't that interesting? What did they do, those four guys who went back within three weeks? What did, they, did they go down to the beach and go, oh, this is rubbish, isn't it? <laughs> it's crappy, that sun's a bit hot, makes my eyes go a bit squinty. You don't have very much grease on the chips, do they? These, these guys came from rich families, so they could phone home, get the money transferred across, okay, and catch the plane back home, okay? I didn't have that ability because when I left Wales, my parents had moved house and got a silent number. <laughs> That, that was the reason why, because I didn't have a choice. It helped make it easier for me to be happy here in Australia. Okay, and I'll explain why. We've all got frontal lobes, right? Pre-frontal <laughs> cortex. And that has many, many functions. It's relatively new in human development. But one of the, one of the key, there's a few key things it does. One of the key things it does is helps us to simulate a situation. Okay? If I were to tell you, for example, that after the show, we're going to go outside there, we're going to have a nice bowl of strawberries with cat poo. Right? You don't actually have to taste that to know whether or not you like it. <laughs> Even cat lovers will say, <laughs> allergic to strawberries. So. <laughs> now there's a really well-known psychologist in the States called Dan Gilbert, and he asserts that our simulator has a tendency to work badly because of a thing called the impact bias, whereby things that we think are going to be absolutely awful for us turn out to be not quite so bad after all. And things on the other side of the coin that we think are going to be amazing for our lives actually turn out to be not so amazing after all, either. He gave an address to a whole bunch of people um, and he asked them to simulate two situations to see which they would prefer. I'm going to ask you to do the same. One is becoming a multimillionaire in a day winning the lottery. $314 million, that's one situation, what you think of that. The other is becoming paraplegic. 
taking a moment to think what she might make you happy. Yeah. Okay, now interestingly, there is data on these two groups of people. And the fact of the matter is this, is that one year after winning the lottery, and one year after losing the use of their legs, paraplegics and lottery winners are equally happy with their lives. He did another experiment, this is to do with choice. In Harvard, he gave these students, who was in his course, his psychology students, the opportunity to do a, uh, a photography course. He taught them how to use his cameras, he taught them how to use the darkroom. He said, go out and take a whole bunch of photographs, which they did. They came back after a few days, brought back, developed the film, he said, okay, choose your favourite two photographs, because we're going to make glossy prints. So they all did that, and they made two beautiful 10 by 8 glossy prints of their favourite photographs. And then he said to them, okay, choose which one you want to give up. Because you get to keep one, we get to keep the other one. And they went, oh, okay. So they chose. Now there were two conditions to this. The first, the first group of students, he said, you make a choice now, okay, and your choice is fine. You can't change your mind, that's it. You've got two or three minutes to decide, and that's it. You're not gonna get, you're not gonna, can't change your mind. So they did, all right? To the other group of students, he said, all right, choose the one you want now, but you've got five days, and during that five days, you can change your mind, simply. Now, just before the swap, and, five, and at the end of that five-day deadline, the students who chose and didn't have a choice to get it back really liked that photograph a lot. And they were, in every way that you could measure happiness, they were happier than they were before. The group who had the choice, guess what? At the end of the five days, they didn't like the picture that they had chosen. Even after the swap, even after the deadline had expired and they'd chosen the one they wanted the most, they didn't like it. And they were not happy as the other group were, as happy as the other group were. Why? Because the reversible condition, the ability to change your mind, is not conducive to synthesizing happiness. And that, I think, is why there are so many whinging, miserable, pommy bastards in Australia. <laughs>